Since the first time I met him, I knew Jeff Dalton was a sensei leader, and that was before we coined the term. Jeff starts his book by sharing a poll from Gallup that confirms a belief at the core of the sensei leader movement that command and control is dead, and Jeff is leading the agile charge to replace it. That's what we're going to talk about today on Walking the Walk. Inspire, empower, and guide people to their very best. These are the people who are walking the walk. Your host, the original sensei leader, Jim Bouchard. Jeff Dalton's new book is Great Big Agile. And in it, he shares a detailed blueprint, and I mean detailed, for exactly how to adopt and implement agile philosophies and techniques in your organization. Well, we'd expect nothing less from Jeff. He's been a leader in, in the tech and software industry for years, working with some of the world's most innovative companies. And he's the president of Broadsword Solutions, a consulting firm that, in their own words, provides an agile environment in which you can be a successful, which you can be successful, learn, and be part of making a great company even better. Well, I met Jeff way back in my Think Like a Black Belt days when he invited me to do a workshop for his team at Broadsword. And I can tell you that uh, I was preaching to the choir there. Jeff and his team are a tremendous group of human-centric leaders who can help you achieve your best. Jeff, I want to dig into Agile and, of course, into the book, but I also want people to understand you as a person. You know, you're a pilot, a motorcycle adventurer, world traveler, and a very accomplished musician. And, in fact, in the preface of Great Big Agile, you talk in detail about the influence uh, that, that your life in music had on you as a leader, right, and particularly how it influenced your Agile mindset. So can we start there? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks for having me on, Jim. It's great to see you once again. It's an and, honor. Uh, it's an honor. <laughs> oh, it's, it's always an honor. And uh, y'all must be pretty excited up there in New England today. Yeah, for people who may be listening later, this is the day after the Super Bowl. And I know most of you are sick of hearing about the Patriots winning a Super Bowl, but uh, we're not sick of it. <laughs> in fact, we're, we're on to number seven. We're ready for number seven now. I, I was saying this morning that it has to be one of the uh, most overestimated, underestimate, underestimates of any NFL uh, team ever. Everybody says, the Pats aren't going to win. The Pats aren't going to win. <laughs> no, people are disappointed because it wasn't a big shootout. But you know what? I've been, I've been preaching it forever, and I guess because I played safety. But look, defense wins championships, right? And they, they proved that. Uh, they proved that yesterday. They mm -hmm. sure did. Hey, I, what you're saying about music is, is so important to, to everything that I do. And, and you know, um, and a lot of people don't know this about me. They, they see me talking to software teams or speaking at conferences, and they, they don't know that I started my life um, as a traveling musician. My, uh, my upbringing was uh, sort of like the Partridge family, unplugged. <laughs> um, we didn't have a yellow bus, but we, uh, we did you know, travel around and perform when I was a youngster and starting about eight years old. And my father was a music teacher and um, my siblings were all musicians. And, and uh, I kind of grew up in a, in a music life and went on to study music in school and had a career as a musician for, for some years. Um, you know, you learn things as a musician that, that you don't learn necessarily in a typical upbringing. I mean, there's other art forms or other experiences you can have. I think martial arts is probably one of those. Um, and I've learned that from you. Uh, but, you know, and I talk about this in the book that, you know, a focus on music or art or dance or theater or martial arts gives you discipline, gives you focus. It gives you uh, experience collaborating with others. It gives you an intense, relentless improvement, you know, real time improvement, getting better and better all the time teaches you to be um, really um, excellent at what you do. And, and handling criticism. I think that's one thing, right? And you touched on that, right? About the, the what do you call it in uh, music school? The juries? Right, right. right. That's, yeah. I talk about that in chapter one of the mm -hmm. book, that the, the music juries and art school has these two that just beat the emotion out of you from an early age. Um, because I remember my first jury, I went to a, a relatively well-known music school, a conservatory in Baltimore. And uh, my first music lesson, we had this jury and, and my teacher said, you should be a shoe repairman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing not at you too because you know, I know. In, in my world because you know I'm, I have a music background too not a scholarly like, one like yours and our juries were when I was playing what we called the chicken wire circuit and it was usually a beer bottle flying past your head <laughs> exactly like in the Blues Brothers movie, exactly right? yeah we, we played actually that place was pretty nice compared to some of the places we played yeah and another lesson he said you can't be a bass player if you don't have any beat <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 
You know, I this is this is uh, he's talking to a guy who had probably played I don't know five hundred to a thousand shows by the uh-huh. time I sh- from my first meeting with him. So I was like reeling like crazy when I walked out of the room. And of course, all I did then was practice eight hours a day, which was in yes. retrospect. The, the reason he did it, I'm sure. But um, the point of the story in the book is that uh, we need to get better at, at listening to feedback from mm-hmm. people around us to improve ourselves. You know, we're so exactly. busy trying to prove our own points. We're so busy stopping and waiting so we can talk as opposed to listening um, for improvement opportunities that we really miss the point. And um, they're not teaching this in school these days. And so a lot of the folks coming up in, in my industry in the computer science and, and software business um, are not good listeners when it comes to feedback. As a matter of fact, it seems like unless you put an exclamation point and a smiley face at the end of every sentence, they think you're being critical of them. No, exactly. I mean, and it was an issue with the millennials, based. and now it's worse now that iGen is coming into the workplace, right? We're seeing that more and more that they – one of the key problems and, and the transition that they're going to have to make is exactly what you just said. Not only are they not good at accepting criticism, they've just never had it. Right. And the problem with that isn't that we want to beat them down and they're not letting right. us. Well, that's Sometimes not what criticism is, right? Criticism is right. to improve you. It's not yeah, It's not disparaging you. Well, it can be, I guess. You it must can, have seen uh, that movie Whiplash. That must have given you flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> of, right. Of course it can be, but how do you get better? Right. I, I mean, I know that that my my shoe repairman uh, story motivated me to get better as fast as I could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't take it as if, oh, man, you mm-hmm. you offended me. I'm leaving here. I'm reporting you. None of that stuff existed back yeah. then. Yeah. We were just there to get better. So in any case, the, when the when the agile software movement came along about 15 years ago, um, it's based on a set of values, and and they talk about these things like excellence and transparency, collaboration and cooperation. Hey, careful! You're <laughs> going to trigger somebody, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and so I thought, man, that sounds awfully familiar. And mm-hmm. and I and I love and I love the guys that started the movement. They're super sharp, and they know what they're doing. But I was like, hey, you guys realize you didn't make this up, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that this has been around, and I say this in the book, this has been around for a thousand years in Western civilization anyway, and I'm sure even longer in, in other civilizations. And, um, you know, this has been something that musicians and artists and, and you know, black belt masters have been talking about for a thousand years. Well, well that's interesting because later in the book, you actually draw a point, and it's it's cool because you use some Japanese terms that, that, yes, I was familiar with through the arts. And one is kaizen, the the, the uh, you know the concept of continual development, or like we say around here, perfection is not a destination; it's a never-ending process, right? right so right. Let, let's skip around a little. Let, let, let's talk about that because how important is that? And you're right; these things, I I applaud the agile movement because. You know, it's you're right. It's not anything new. I mean, sometimes when I'm doing presentations, I actually slap myself on the head and I say, you know, this stuff is not rocket surgery. It's stupid. Right, right. It's just that we have to the basics, the fundamentals, especially with human behavior, need to be practiced. You talked about discipline, right? If we're not yeah. if we're not doing it, we're not doing it, if that makes sense. You know, so right. let's talk about well, Kaizen and, and how that relates to Agile. Sure. Well, Kaizen, of course, has been around forever. It's mm-hmm. been used uh, in Japan and, and other places. It's been made more famous in recent years by Toyota and other companies that have adopted it. Right. And while Kaizen is not specifically an agile technique, it's used more in the lean setting. It's something that I included in the book because it really personifies the idea of agility, mm-hmm. uh, where we're constantly on, in an iterative and an incremental way. We're identifying areas and problems we're trying to solve. We do root cause analysis to figure out uh, what can be done to improve performance. We identify it, we make those improvements, and we slip them into the system right away. Mm-hmm. Um, the, what they've done in the agile um, world is kind of cool is they've shortened their work cycles to anywhere from one to four weeks, depending on the team. And they essentially are performing constant Kaizans as they're going. So at the end of every one to four week period, the team performs one of these. They're called retrospective in the in the agile world. And they you know, identify, OK, here's what we did well. Here's what we didn't do so well. What are we going to change to do things better? Mm-hmm. And in this way, their process is empirical 
uh, rather than defined. And, and this is kind of an important point in the book that will probably resonate with you, Jim. Um, there's basically two theories of process management, in, at least in my business. The defined process control, DPC, is basically the command and control model. It says, mm-hmm. here's the process you shall follow, and uh, you shall follow it whether you want to or not. And we'll measure the heck out of it. And when we decide that it needs to be changed based on our data, we'll go through the process of making major changes to it. Of course, what companies do is they almost never change it. Mm. And lots of stuff happens that shouldn't be happening. And that's kind of the the normal behavior that we see. Uh, As opposed to empirical process control, EPC, which is kind of championed by the Agile folks, um, this is the idea that no process is constant, that you start with a foundation and then each team uh, modifies and adjusts as they go doing these iterations or sprints, sometimes they're called, or you can think of them as iterative kaizans in a way. Um, they've done a really good job. I think it's one of the powerful things about the Agile movement is this idea of teams gathering around their work every one to four weeks and making changes to the way they're going to work. So I, I think while the folks that that put the original Agile manifesto together in 2001 were really super innovative, their real innovation was packaging up the stuff that you and I call excellence. You know, they created a set of uh, what they call ceremonies. They don't use the word process so much, right, but right. they took they took a ceremonial approach to software development. So you can think of these as katas almost, mm-hmm. where there's a defined set of behaviors, defined movement that they learn. And there's six or seven of these that they just execute over and over again and get really good at executing and then improving their forms and maybe adding some new things as they go. Um, so that was re- that's really the magic in it is that they've put ceremonies around stuff that we've been talking about for many years and it really caught on like wildfire because people all of a sudden seem to get it. They're like, oh, I don't <laughs> get how this works now. And, yeah, you know, a lot yeah. of us who've been who have been giving speeches for years kind of hitting ourselves in the head saying, man, why didn't I think of that? That's a well, great idea. You know, but that's that's the thing, isn't it? That, like I said, these these philosophies, and I can't remember who exactly said this, but everything you're talking about, you're exactly right. Lao Tzu talked about this. Yeah. You know, uh, Aristotle, Socrates, they all talked about these same things. Um, but Joseph Campbell, when he was writing Power of Myth and whatnot, he was talking about the loss of ceremony and how detrimental that is because we need these uh-huh. rituals, we need these practices. And when you said kata, for people who don't understand that, what that is, is it's a choreographed set of movements that we practice, right? And you, exactly, you're supposed to follow them as close as you can and yeah. not to be bound by them, but that gives you the framework. So this is something I do believe you know imprints nicely in the agile world as well, right? It, it's not just... It, it can look for, for, from an untrained eye like a, a T-shirt slogan, go with the flow kind of philosophy. But right. It presupposes a lot of discipline, doesn't it? You need to know, you need to know your fundamentals. You need to know your processes yep. in order to make this work, right? It's not a lazy person's uh, shortcut. Right. And this is, uh, this is how I sort of started the book uh, around this music metaphor, because it's also exactly like learning your scales and learning your key signatures and learning your tempos and learning, you know, all of the music theory, becoming a great musician. It's a very similar process to what the Agile folks are going through now, uh, which is just really ironic when you look at a lot of other things going on in societies where people are throwing off processes and and uh, and traditions like crazy mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. here in the US we're seeing you know people are just tossing out traditions like you know you know like nobody's business some of them maybe deserve to be tossed but some of them i think exist to make us a more um you know, let's call it lubricant society, <laughs> right? Lubricated right. society, right? Because some of those things, like like general politeness and using Mister and Miss and and opening doors for people and all that, they exist to create a social lubricant that makes us all get along. No, you're, you're hitting the yeah. nail right on the head. And the thing with that yeah. too is that that's when we see sometimes, you know, those of us who are you know students of history and philosophy. Uh, this is how I pulled all my hair out is because uh, <laughs> little, literally sometimes, you know, I'm at a leadership conference and I'm listening and I'm saying, this guy said he invented this. You know, there's yeah. there's no way he this. This is nothing new. But here's what happens. Yeah. If we lose these traditions, we lose these ceremonies, then we do have to reinvent them. And what a waste That's that right. is and if we preserve yeah. them. And again, like I said, I, I like the way you organized it, too, around um, what is it? The uh, 
basically circles of performance right. circles, right? And it includes the ceremonies, the techniques, and, and assessment. Because that, that I want you to talk a little bit about, too, because we have a lot of military leaders on the program. And they often talk about the, you know, the after action assessment. And, sure. You know, people look wide eyed. What do you mean? You think about that afterwards? Well, hell yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, if you want to. Improve, I always like, right? I always liken it to, uh, to football players. You know, mm -hmm. when, when people ask me what, what's the real value of a retrospective? I'm like, mm -hmm. do you think the NFL teams just go back to their locker rooms and go home and go drink a beer? No, they're in there watching the film. Right. You know, they're in there zeroing in. The coach is saying, why did you take seven steps instead of six? I mean, they just really are really good at it. You see it in, in sports, too, like swimming, mm -hmm. where they watch the videos and they're like one extra stroke, extra half stroke. You know, you shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And they're relentlessly improving themselves mm -hmm. every minute. And and so when I when I put the model together, the, the model in the books called the Agile Performance Holarchy. And the reason I named it that is that um, in a book called Ghost in the Machine, there's a there's a story about a holon or the whole yeah, set of. Well, I'm glad you're hitting this because I had a big note. What the hell is a holon? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I knew you'd have a, a good way to explain it. So. A holon is a an entity that um, lives and breathes all on its own, but also is part of a greater whole. That sounds so, very zen. Let's break that down. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, an example of a halon might be a, a cell in your body, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, you have billions of them. And each one operates under its own set of rules. It doesn't need any intelligence to operate. It Your skin cell operates and it does its thing and interacts with other cells. But it also interacts with other cells to the greater whole. It covers your skin, right? Mm. Um a, a hotline might be a certain activity in, in an organization that can take place all standalone, but also as part of a greater whole. So it reaches an ultimate conclusion of delivering a product or something mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that. So what I tried to do in the book is identify what are the key uh, performance activities in order to run an organization. And I came up with uh, these six performance circles leading being the most important one. And the reason I made them circles is because I want them to continually evolve and continually improve mm -hmm. and expand and, I, right? mm -hmm. and expand. And I, it's like, so I think of it like the solar system, right? And I didn't want um, to be limited to, uh, to being a linear process. I wanted this to be much more empirical. Mm. So contained within each performance circle is a set of related halons. Each one of them can stand alone and do whatever it needs to do without asking permission. And this is key to self-organization. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, the not asking permission in order to succeed at its task but also contribute to the greater good and the whole of the product. Now, or the you, now you're going to trigger some people there for sure, because that requires a lot of trust, doesn't it? Yeah. So that's, so this whole notion of high trust is also part of the agile lexicon. Mm -hmm. And, um, I love working with, with I, was, I was just working with a, an executive the other day that said, I'm trying to get my team to adopt agile and, and no matter how many people I fire, they won't, <laughs> they won't comply. Yeah, right. like, yeah, how, yeah. how many people did you fire? And he's like, well, they just won't do what I tell them. I said, maybe they're not the, they're not the problem. Right. Right. And so this notion of high trust is important because people just don't know how to make this happen. And high trust doesn't mean that a leader just lets go and lets people do whatever they want. And right. says, mm -hmm. you just go do what you think is right. High trust requires an extraordinary amount of discipline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these, 100%. You know, mm -hmm. and and one of one of the aspects of high trust that made me think about taking this hall on approach is that people don't have real clarity about what their mission is individually. Like mm -hmm. they don't have individually individual clarity about what their mission is, what's expected of them and what they're allowed to do without asking permission. So I keep using this phrase without asking for permission because it's key to this entire model. Um, if I have to ask for permission for something, that means I'm involving somebody else who's going to give me an answer I may or may not want to hear. And it's just going to take a lot of time and may make a big mess. Plus, I'm going to step on a lot of toes and there's going to be a lot of issues. So what, what we do is we, we encourage companies to abandon traditional job roles and job titles and instead replace it with a circular model where roles are defined uh, based on the actual thing they produce or do. 
and accountabilities are then assigned to those roles. Now, a person might have seven or eight or 10 or 12 roles. I know in my company, I think I have about 25. Um, and um, every time I'm executing that role, I have a different set of accountabilities that uh, I use to uh, execute that task. And I don't have to ask permission for any of them. And all of the employees in the company can are authorized to do that and enabled to do that by senior management because all that stuff's been clearly defined. And most importantly, they self-subscribe to it when the role is defined. So the role gets defined and then people self-subscribe to the role and then they know exactly what their accountabilities are at any given point in time. And this is a bit of an improvement on the original agile approach where the term self-subscription is used pretty liberally, but there isn't really a clear definition of these roles and accountabilities. Now, I wish I had made this concept up of the roles and accountabilities and, and before I included it myself, but I actually didn't invent the idea. There was There's a gentleman named Brian Robertson that wrote a book about it years ago. Um, he has a completely different model, which I don't use in the book, but this concept of roles and accountabilities is one of the ceremonies that I've adopted and it's clearly um, a foundation for self-organization and trust. It's really what's missing in high trust organization. So we've uh, we've recognized him and the uh, the ceremony in the book, and it's foundational to making this happen. Well, you just opened a few cans of worms there. So let's uh, let's circle back to a couple of things. First of all, what you hit on really speaks to me, and I'm going to go back 2,500 years and quote Lao Tzu again, and I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but. You know, he said the best leader is the leader when the people barely know he exists. When when the work right. is done, right, the work is done, they'll sit down and say, we did it ourselves. Um, and that, again, speaks to that level of trust you're talking about. But, you know, one of my, I guess, more more contemporary heroes, uh, General Patton, said the same thing, right? Never yeah, tell people right. uh, what how to do something. Tell them what to do, and they'll surprise you with, your, with their ingenuity. But right. that, Patton's right. a good example for that. Lao Tzu the same way, because both of those... Pre, they, they, it's it, it. How would you say? It presumes an incredibly high level of training and preparation, right? Yeah. Like you said, right. you can't just turn people loose. You have to empower them. You have to give them the tools they need to prepare to be prepared for the roles that you're going to give them. Are we are we singing in harmony there? That's exactly right. Is you know I I refer to it as uh, the new leader is a steward of an enabling infrastructure mm -hmm. based on discipline and knowledge. And uh, without that, uh, it doesn't happen. And I, I always tell my clients, you know, it's not magic. This doesn't happen magically. You can't just send out an email and saying, hey, guys, I trust you now. You do what's right for the company. No, we need to define a vision of what is right for the company. Mm. Each role has to be clearly defined with clear set of accountabilities and deliverables. Now, the magic is that you can empower the teams to – modify, evolve, and adjust to those roles and accountabilities. In fact, we do that in our company. We have regular quarterly meetings where we put all put them all up on the wall and we say, let's go at it. Which ones don't you want anymore? Which ones did we get wrong? People start adding, you know, responsibilities to me sometimes when we do that, which is all good. I mean, if, if they think that uh, they shouldn't be on the hook for doing something, then I should. I'm more than happy to take it and I'm more than happy to offload some things too. But there's what, what I, I try do. to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. This is that what I try to do is be a steward of an enabling infrastructure. Mm. And I'm in charge of operating that machine as a leader, that enabling infrastructure. What I'm not in charge of doing is telling people how to do their job. Mm -hmm. And that was a leap for us. You know, when we started our company 15 years ago, we were very much command and control. We had directors and we had people giving tasking and. And, you know, you've met our team, uh, not the kind of team that likes that sort of thing so much as we've learned. Uh, you know, you can't you can't really manage stallions and, and thoroughbreds. And so we switched over about five years ago and said, no, this is we're going to we're going to create this enabling infrastructure. And uh, it's worked great since then. Yeah. For, if for what it's worth, too, I believe you had much more of that in place um, on an informal basis. Right. It's just that, yeah. you know, we, and we still, and this is the thing too, when people hear me criticize, I'm sure you run into the same thing, criticize the command and control. There are times when that's an appropriate 
technique, yeah. you know, but th that's the difference between tactics and strategy. Tactics, that's something you're going to use in the moment, and, and, and it may be sometimes contrary to your overall strategy, right? You have to go, with, you know, with what the conditions are, are dictating. But having said that, the strategy is what's so key. Now, one of the things, and we do have to do some workshops together. There's just no doubt about that. We keep talking Absolutely. about Absolutely. But one of the things, I, I, can, I can hear the pushback um, based on something you just said, and I want to hear your take on it because in martial arts, we talk an awful lot about focus, right? And definitely that's the imprint on the sensei leader movement. And people confuse that because they think that it means you can only do one thing. As martial right. artists, we learn that no, focus means letting go of distractions and detractions and doing it very quickly so that you can shift your your complete attention from one function to another, right? From one role to right. another. So That's right. Yeah, tell us how that cause I again, I cheated because I re read the book, but <laughs> you know, how do you how do you manage that in an agile environment? How how do you help people uh develop that sense of focus? Well, look, it takes practice. Humans mm -hmm. just have trouble with this and it takes practice and it takes short iterations and, and, and many iterations of practice of the same role and it, and it takes coaching and it takes mentoring and it takes training and it takes a big investment in a leader's time and, and frankly, financially to really bring a team up to a self-organizing state. It, it's really an enlightened high level of performance compared to a command and control organization. So w one of the things that we do in our company and I encourage our clients to do is to, uh, to be, to learn to be agile by being agile. In other words, lead using these techniques, follow using these techniques, deliver using these techniques and run your whole company using these techniques from top to bottom. Um, and also adopt, you know, we took kind of took a page out of the agile movement from the early 2000s, adopt a model that works, mm -hmm. you know, a model that you can follow that has ceremonies and has techniques and can be measured. And that's kind of we, uh, section two of the book gets into that. It's that agile performance hierarchy model that we encourage leaders to adopt because it really makes it easy for them to understand what are the actions and steps they need to take to successfully make this transition happen. We've even included a way for them to assess their organization uh, through an assessment model through some of our partners uh, to come on site and really use this model as a way to give them a, a rating, so to speak, or a performance level mm -hmm. for each of these six circles so that they understand exactly where they, you know, where they stand at the meta level. Now, we always talk about relentless improvement at the individual level, but this really adopts it at the organizational level. So the right. whole organization can move up the ladder and get better and better over time. No, and you hit one of the quotes that I, was, that I highlighted from the book, too, where you said, don't do agile be agile yeah. or like we say, right. Right. Lead, lead by example, right? You have to model yeah. the behavior you expect from others. You went back to that story about the guy who couldn't get the people to do it, right? Well, no, no, yeah. do it. <laughs> right? You do it. You, you first. Do it. You do it first. Listen, we were almost out of time, but I, I did want to talk about this too, because again, you're, you're hinting at this. Um, part of the vestiges of this command and control mindset that, that we still hang on to so, so strongly um, you know, that, and believe me, people who are listening, we're not saying that the management parts of things are not important. They are. It they says, are. it yeah. says, uh, Admiral Grace Hopper said so, so nicely. She said, management is about things. Leadership is about people. The problem yeah. being that for too long, we forgot about, uh, we, we, we went overboard on management, she said, and forgot about yeah. leadership. And that's what it is. So as you make a shift to a culture like this, I think one of the things that people need to understand is that. Uh, you've got to, the, the leaders that are higher in positions of authority have to get out of those management tasks a little more and get more yeah. into the leadership tasks, right? You, you've got to lead by walking around in this type of model, right? That's right. And I, I, I'm so tickled. You, Admiral Grace Hopper is one of my favorite characters in history. <laughs> oh, and she's wonderful. And uh, yeah. I, I love her story about, she always used to say, you know, we're, you think you're drowning in data. Wait until 10 years from now, we'll be drowning in information. Sure. Boy, and she, she was got right that about one. that. Huh? She got yeah. that one right. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, so the cu couple of things going on there, Jim, that are really interesting. First of all, business schools uh, in the country from, you know, from Cambridge to Stanford haven't caught on yet. Mm. Um, that command and control is dead. And all you have to do is look at the Gallup studies that I quote in the book going back to the 70s that 
every institution that we hold dear in this country, people have lost faith in the command and control leadership of mm -hmm. politicians, mm -hmm. banks, schools, businesses, police, you name it. Every single category, religion, every single category, uh, we've gone down 30, 40 percentage points in terms of approval of those entities. So they haven't caught on yet, and they're still pumping out MBAs, and I'm sure they're wonderful educations and everything, uh, but they're pumping out people with MBAs that are more based on traditional command and control. Mm. The other side of it, if I could just sort of finish with this, I know we're running out of time, is that I think it was um, – De Israel, I can't remember the gentleman, the prime minister of, of Israel, and I actually quote him in the book, but now in the interview, my, his name is at the tip of my tongue. Um, one of the uh, former prime ministers of Israel was quoted as saying, I learned to climb a greasy pole to get here, and you don't think I'm letting go of it now, do you? <laughs> right. And yeah. so we've got an entire – uh, you know, cadre of you know, literally millions of leaders slash managers who frankly don't always know which they are mm. um, that have gotten there by using command and control methods, sometimes mm -hmm. you know, climbing on other people, sometimes by doing it by hurting people, sometimes doing it completely honestly, but just getting up in the levels because they were good at numbers or whatever that requirement happened yeah, to be. Prom promotion by performance, right? Promotion by performance. And so – We've got a, this huge impediment in front of us now. Not only do we have this huge cadre, even the folks that came into business with an agile mindset, they learned that in order to move up, mm -hmm. they had to change that. And I've seen this happen so many times where like a software development manager gets in and all of a sudden he becomes chief information officer and he's forgotten what got him there. Mm. And and then the business schools, of course, are replenishing at thousands and thousands and thousands a year. So we need to start at the schools and we need to transform the leaders that we have. So it's a it's a massive task. But until you do until you do that, we have what I like to call an organizational tight mismatch. And, and I use that term because in software, a type mismatch is when one data type tries to talk to another data type like a like a character to a number. And it blows up the software. And that's mm -hmm. a really classic software error um, that all programmers know about. And you have an organizational type mismatch. We have all these people on the lower levels trying to self-organize and be agile and being they're really excited about it. And then you got just one or two levels of management up, people squashing them down, saying, duh, it's nice that you're doing some of those things. Just yeah. don't go too far, they, buddy. Right. They don't that's, recognize the leadership on the front lines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just don't yeah. just don't try to climb my greasy pole. <laughs> there right. You go. So there you go. that's that's what's going on. And, and, you know, I wrote the book just for those people and, uh, you know, hope they like it because <laughs> well, it's coming. We've got and, to have uh, you on again and we're going to start something um, where we're going to be shifting some of our content over to probably the Patreon um, model. Oh yeah. And, and when we do, one of the things that we've got planned is a, an exclusive book club for, for patrons at a certain level. And we're going to have authors like yourself on, and we're going to make sure people get a copy of the book first and get some time to digest it. And then hopefully the authors will come on and we'll really dig into, into the content. So I hope you'll be back on that. And you're always Excellent. welcome on the show, obviously. And, and great big agile. How do we get the book and how do we get in touch with you at Broadsword? You can definitely get the book at Amazon or at uh, any, you know, any book retailer online that you would like. So I'd love to have you check it out. You can get it in both Kindle and book format. And uh, you can always reach me at Broadsword at broadswordsolutions.com um, or at my blog, askthecmmiappraiser.com. And I uh, would love to hear from you. And uh, Jim, we'd love to have you on our podcast in the future also. So thanks for having me. Oh, anytime, anytime. Thanks so much. Hey, listen, get involved with the Sensei Leader Movement. I'm unabashedly recruiting all of you who have listened to this program. If you liked it, of course, like it and share it. Please share it with people you think would appreciate Jeff's insights. And just all you got to do to get involved is really simple. It doesn't cost you a dime to get started. All you have to do is come to the senseileader.com. And you'll get, uh, I still think you'll get a free copy, ebook copy of the Sensei Leader when you sign up. That's all, you, that's all you need to do. And then we'll tell you about all the other good stuff that's going on. So, Jeff, again, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be talking to you very, very soon. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you. All right. Keynotes, workshops, retreats, webinars, and ongoing training. Each program customized to your unique needs, interests, goals, and budget. 
inspire, empower, and guide people to their very best. Learn more about Jim Bouchard and the Sensei Leader at thesenseileader.com.